This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Debbie Kilb. I'm from Scripps Institution of Oceanography. I'm a seismologist and my topic of research is earthquake source physics. And most importantly, I want to learn how a main shock influences an aftershock. And we'll talk a little bit about that too. Everything that I'm going to talk about today is on this web link. It's the only thing you really need. It'll have all the 3D visualizations, the interactive web activities. It'll have my PowerPoint that you can download, other PowerPoints you can download, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The title of my talk is Earthquakes, Teaching Tools Beyond Static Images and Flat Maps. And so to start, I thought it would be good if we began with a static image and a flat map. So here we go. This is something I used in a lot of outreach programs. I would ask people, which state has had the most large earthquakes in the last 30 years? And I'd get a lot of answers. And so I'd say, well, why don't we pick the top three? And a lot of people would pick Texas because it's the largest, thinking that, well, it's the largest, maybe that's more room for earthquakes, which is good thinking, so you can talk to your class about that. So the top three are uh, Alaska's number one, California, and Hawaii. And the important thing there is that those three are on the western seaboard of the United States. But the answer key that they show, all of a sudden Alaska has gone down here to the Gulf, and Hawaii is somehow south. So when you see any kind of flat maps like this, it's important to also get out your globe and say, well, you know, is that true? Is Alaska really there? So here we are in California. Alaska's way up here. It's not in the Gulf Course. And Hawaii is out here to the west, not to the south. So when you use a flat map, always have your globe handy to say, well, that Alaska looks like it's really moved. Another thing, if you're just beginning your um, seismology lesson, is to sign up for Earthquake Notification Service. And what this does is it's through the USGS, and I've signed up for it on my cell phone. So anytime we have a 5.5 earthquake or above, I'll get a page on my cell phone. And I get about two or three pages a day. And perhaps during our, our lecture here, we'll get a page. I hope. Nothing devastating, but that would be nice. Um, you can also set it up so it's a different magnitude limit at night if you don't want to be woken up. I have to say, as a seismologist, every time I hear my phone go off, I'm like, hmm, I wonder what that was. <laughs> Get up, check. Um, you could also, if you don't want to put it to your cellular device, you can have an email sent to you also. I have that kind of a belts and suspenders. So this is a great resource to have on the spot. Oh, we just have an earthquake. Let's go look and see what those seismograms look like. So that's just set up for five and a half and above global earthquakes. I also want to know what's going on locally here in California. And to do that, I use this interactive web tool. This is a screenshot of it. I'm going to actually bring it up now. And we're, we're seeing here, scroll down a little bit. Each yellow triangle is a seismic station run by Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And it's measuring what's going on at that location every day, all day. It's measuring up and down vertical motion, and it's measuring north and south and east and west, three components of information. That's what's happening at each triangle. And any earthquake that it's recorded is shown with a square, and here it's showing the last two weeks of earthquakes. Anything within the last six hours is a little uh, red earthquake. So we can click on this little guy, I think, and we can see where it was. It was a magnitude 1.3 that happened within the last six hours. Um, you can also zoom in, just like Google Maps, <coughs> Looks like we had another little earthquake here, magnitude 1.8, a little bit bigger. The next question your students will probably ask you is, well, that 1.8, what fault is that on? And so you have to go, oh, do I know? What, is, what fault is that on? So we've made that easier for you. What you can do is you can click on and off the different fault locations. So let's start with the San Andreas Fault. So you can just use the, the tab on the sidebar. So here's the main trace of the San Andreas Fault. It runs to the east of the Salton Sea. The other uh, faults that we're having some of these earthquakes on is the San Jacinto Fault. We can cl click on and off that main branch. 
And you can see this little earthquake here was probably on the San Jacinto Fault. It has some other associated faults with it. The other fault of interest to a lot of people is the Elsinore Fault. It's one of the closer ones to us in San Diego. And the uh, Rose Canyon Fault runs right through San Diego. The nice thing about Google Maps here is we can actually zoom in and see where the Rose Canyon Fault is. It traverses part of the I-5 freeway. So as you're driving from Mission Beach up to La Jolla on I-5, you're actually driving along the Rose Canyon Fault. That earthquake hasn't had a large earthquake in years, though, so rest assured, I think you're fine. One thing a lot of people say, well, maybe earthquakes are only in California because that's where the seismometers are. Well, we can check that theory. There's a new program called EarthScope's <coughs> US Array program, and what it's doing is it's putting seismic stations all over the United States. We're going to show a little movie of that here. The red little cubes here are the seismic stations measuring 24 hours a day, and they can measure pretty small earthquakes down to magnitude 2 or so. We're going to watch this movie go. We're going to see the year and month of the data that's being recorded. You can see where the seismic stations are and where the earthquakes that are being recorded, the yellow dots. That was a 7.0 offshore there that we saw light up. You can see the hint of the San Andreas Fault here. It's just one month of data. The important point here is we see absolutely no seismicity in middle America. And that's because most of the seismometers here are on the west coast. So let's watch as it slowly traverses to the east. And you can see now we can see a little bit more seismicity. So it does depend how far away from the seismic station you are to record these smaller earthquakes. You can notice up here there's a big, what looked like a swarm. I thought, what on earth is that in Canada? And I went to look at that a little bit more carefully. And those earthquakes are pretty shallow, and they always occur during the day. And that's a signal that that's a quarry at that location. Next question, do earthquakes occur completely randomly, or do they have some kind of pattern that tends to repeat? And if you ask any classes, they almost always get it right. They know there's some kind of pattern that tends to repeat. Here's a look at the global distribution of earthquakes that define the plate tectonic boundaries. So a flat map of the world. Uh, Alaska is up here in the north as it should be, and Hawaii is relatively far from us as it should be. Each earthquake shown here, magnitude 5.5 and above, is shown as a red orb. And you can see that some are smattered here and there, but most of them define these plate tectonic boundaries. Another nice way to look at it is through this interactive seismic eruption program. So this only runs on a Windows machine, so here I just have a snapshot of it for my Mac. You can see the times ticking down here. We're in 1968 in August. And you can interactively figure out how, what's your earthquake cutoff level. Do you want magnitude 3 and above, 5 and above, 8 and above? And you can see, even by 1978, we can map out the plate tectonic boundaries. The sounds that you're hearing, that whenever there's a small earthquake, it's ding, 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 and a big earthquake, boom, 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 boom. And so you can hear, it's mostly ding, 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 meaning we have primarily small magnitude earthquakes, not that many large magnitude earthquakes. It's also color-coded by depth and, and size by magnitude. So you can see regions in yellow here, where there's the deeper earthquakes, are probably regions of subduction zone. So you have subduction zone here in South America, and in the Tonga Trench. A lot of students like to wait and see when their birthday goes by. <laughs> you got to also uh, click on and off the plate tectonic boundaries, all kinds of things to do with this one. Um, so we've seen a static image of the global distribution of seismicity. We've seen the temporal evolution of the global distribution of seismicity. Let's now look at it in 3D. So here again is our globe. Each point on here is an earthquake and we can go underground. This is freeware, runs on any platform. It's called Flatermouse IBU 4D. So you can see some regions, the earthquakes extend down to deeper depths, and others are pretty shallow. The deepest down here goes to about 700 kilometers. So subduction zones have the deepest earthquakes, and the mid-Atlantic ridge here, shallow earthquakes. How do seismologists measure earthquakes? Um, before we get into that, we, it's important to tell your class the difference between a seismograph and a seismogram. People are continually messing this up. And I haven't found a good way of really introducing that except to say seismograph or seismometer is the instrument and the seismogram is the wiggle. So it used to be called a seismograph because it would actually graph something on paper. You're probably used to these kind of drums. 
But now we tend to call it a seismometer because it's not graphing on paper, it's all electrical. The seismogram is the actual wiggle that's recorded by the seismometer. This is an installation at Pinion Flat, which is here just outside of San Diego. This is a seismometer, and the laser beam here is to make sure that it's lined up north, south, east, west. We have to get that dead on, otherwise our, our recordings won't be accurate. Once we get that lined up, then we put these boxes on top, and again we have three different recordings. Vertical, up, down, north, south, and east, west. Has a lot of uh, computer equipment and power. So that installation was here at PFO station out by the San Jacinto Fault. We're here in San Diego, and the closest station is on top of Mount Soledad, SOL. Now somebody asked earlier, what does the real-time data look like? Here's just a snapshot. This is 24 hours of recording. Mount Soledad station is on the top here, shown with this trace. PFO is on the bottom trace. And if you look at this, even if you're not a seismologist, you go, what is that? So there's something that's drastically changed at this time. The amplitudes have gotten large, and they've gotten large on all the stations. When something like that happens, you know that there's a large global earthquake. So this was the Haiti magnitude 7 earthquake of January of this year. So that's a global earthquake relatively far away. We can also look at a local earthquake. Um, here our time scale has changed. This is one minute. Mount Soledad's recording is right here. And you can see that it arrived at Mount Soledad before some of the others, and that's because this earthquake was to the south. So this is what a relatively close 4.5 earthquake looks like. It's not arriving at the stations all at the same time. So with that, let's go back and check to see if we've had any earthquakes <coughs> since we've been talking. Oh, does anybody see anything? There's something very small that's actually not picked up by our detection right here. And that's, I know that's an earthquake because it's felt on all the stations. Ooh, how exciting. So this is just a one hour recording. We can go and look at 24 hours of recording. Mount Soledad is the closest station to us here, here on the top. And what it's doing is it's saying, let's say at Mount Soledad it's going, was that an earthquake? Was that an earthquake? Was that an earthquake? Was that an earthquake? Ah, yes, that was an earthquake. And then the algorithm goes, was there an earthquake at any other station? And if the answer is yes for four or more, they go, ah, this must be an earthquake. We locate it, determine the magnitude, and that's automatically put out. So we'll go back and check this again to see if we have any earthquakes before the end. We can measure all kinds of other things. We can measure teenagers running by. Elephants are a problem in some, some areas. Camels have been known to eat our station cables. Once we had a station go offline and nobody knew, and somebody took a look at the real-time cameras, and lo and behold, a lightning struck. That was a problem there. Uh, we can record tornadoes going by. When we had that big rainstorm, I could look and see grass everywhere, so you know that was a high rain. Shuttle landings and earth tides. So this information, to me, is noise, and I don't want that, but it might be somebody else's important data. So three times of... Earthquake waves. This is when people kind of get bored. You start introducing P waves or compressional waves. They move like this, six to eight kilometers per hour. S waves are slower, shear waves. They move like this, 3.5 kilometers per hour. Pretty soon no one's listening to you, right? By the time you get to surface waves, they travel at the surface of the Earth three to four kilometers per second. And everyone's like, ah, numbers, fast, slow, whatever, I don't care. So the way to introduce P waves, S waves, and surface waves, I think, is to ask your class, who's been to Disneyland? And most of them, if they haven't been, they at least know about it, and say, well, how long does it take to get to Disneyland? So you can explain to them that if there's an earthquake in San Diego, the P waves from that earthquake will be at Disneyland in 25 seconds, fast. The S waves, 41 seconds, and surface waves, 50 seconds. Very, very fast. These seismic waves are traveling really fast. And that's when they kind of get it. Okay, these are really fast waves. Um, just to reiterate, the P and the S waves are body waves. They go through the, the earth and the interior of the earth. And the surface waves go on the exterior of the earth. So if you have a really deep earthquake, the surface waves are kind of small. If you have a shallow earthquake, the surface waves are going to be larger.
So the question is, do the surface waves do the most damage? And the answer is yes. They have, um, actually you can see it from the seismogram. So here's your P wave, smaller amplitude, the S wave a little bit bigger, and the surface waves are the larger amplitudes. So those are the ones that are going to cause the most damage. How do seismologists determine where an earthquake occurs? Well, if they're shaking right now, immediately, we probably know it's relatively close. But if it's not close, what do we do? And we use something called trilateration, and you probably all teach this. Here's a little movie. The precise location of an earthquake can be found when the distance is known from three seismic stations. On a globe, a circle is drawn around each seismic station. The radius of these circles is equal to the distance from the seismic station to the epicenter. The point where the three circles intersect is the epicenter of the quake. So next I'll demonstrate a web application where we can actually locate the earthquakes ourselves. We can pick a seismic station and say, what does the seismograms look like? And here we have audio and visual to this. We can pick where the P wave is. It's the first seismic arrival. Oh. oh. Then we can pick the S wave. Let's say we get it wrong. Ugh. Oh, that must not be right. Ugh. No, where could it be? So oh. there we go. So when you're happy with your answer, and you can use these visual clues here and along with the audio clues, you can submit it. And you know, OK, well that's the information from this seismic station shown in red. We know that the earthquake occurred somewhere within in the circumference of this arc. Let's try another station. So P wave is a first burst of energy. Oh. oh always the easier one. Oh. Fantastic. Now we look to see where the circles intersect. There's two possibilities. One is out here, and the other one is here. And we can make an educated guess, but since we have so much data, why don't we go ahead and, and try another station? Let's try this one. Oh. P wave, easy to pick. S wave, a little oh. harder. Oh. Fantastic. Aha. So now this is the only point where the three circles intersect. We can move our epicenter location to where they intersect. Ah, I got it right. Well, it's fantastic. I can put in my name. There's my certificate. You can hang that on my wall. You could also have your class do this and say, well, I want you to locate three earthquakes, um, print out the completion certificate, or if you want to save some trees, email them to the teacher, etc. So it's a really nice interactive tool that is also good for homework. You can also estimate the distance to an earthquake using just one seismic station. The distance formula is it's the difference between the S wave arrival and the P arrival in seconds times 8, and that's the distance in kilometers. Got our formula? Let's give it a rip. So here's the seismograms from the Haiti earthquake. Here's the P arrival, the S arrival. These are the surface waves. In fact, this is a really exam good example of the Love and Rayleigh wave. The Love wave is here, and the Rayleigh waves are here. Um, but what we want to do is determine the difference in time between the P wave arrival and the S wave arrival. So it's about nine minutes. Remember, we need this in seconds, though. So we multiply by 60 times 8, about 4,320 kilometers. Or we can convert that to degrees if we want by dividing by 111, 40 degrees. Well, 40 degrees on my globe is about the length of this ribbon. And this is recorded in San Diego. So let's see where we think this earthquake might have came from. So here's San Diego, and we know it can't possibly have been down in South America, it has to be relatively closer, and it does line up to with where Haiti was. So it's a good just back of the envelope calculation. So does everybody here think they can identify a P wave on any seismogram? Silence. Does anybody think they can identify an S wave on any, si on any seismogram? Silence again. As my daughter would say, no. <laughs> and she would actually be right, because there are some locations where there's no P wave arrival and there's no S wave arrival. It's in the shadow zone. So here's a little movie that shows you where that is. Earthquakes generate two main types of seismic or shock waves, body waves and surface waves. Body waves travel through the interior of the Earth. 
The fastest of these are primary, or P waves. These compressional waves move faster in dense rock and slower in fluids. Thus, their speed and direction change. Because they are deflected by the Earth's core, P waves are not seen in the so-called shadow zone. The slowest body waves are secondary, or S waves. S waves are elastic shear waves that move material sideways at right angles to their direction of travel. Because secondary waves travel only through solids, they do not penetrate the Earth's outer molten core. For this reason, there is also an S wave shadow zone. The slower seismic surface waves do not penetrate the Earth's interior, but follow the surface. So if you look at a seismogram and you're like, I have no idea where P is, and I have no idea where S is, it could be because that recording is from the seismic shadow zone. Next thing, this is always of interest to everybody, how do seismologists determine the magnitude of the earthquake? And again, it's always fun to do it yourself. So let's use this little web application. And pick a seismogram. We don't have any uh, visual or audio clues here, but now that you're prime seismologist, we figure you can do it yourself. Identify the P wave and the S wave. So there's the P wave and the S wave and the amplitude. And if we look below, the two numbers that I'm most interested in is here, kilometers, how far away is the earthquake from the seismic station, about 50 kilometers, and the magnitude, 3.71. The other thing you can do with this application is if you look at this number, 50 kilometers, that has to do with how far away the P and S waves are. Let's just move this S wave just for fun, and you can see that number is growing up to 100. So the further away the P and S waves are, the farther away the earthquake is from that seismic station. So if we look at these, this seismogram and this seismogram, this one has the P and S waves further away, right? Let's try doing that one. Here's our P wave. Here's our S wave. And here's our amplitude. 122 kilometers. So we can see that one is further away than the other. And magnitude 3.61. And again, you have some uncertainty there. Um, additional inf information, you can click here for the instructions. It was a fun little web application. This was made by one of our uh, interns, a high school intern from High Tech High, Evan Morikawa. Next thing is to talk about is earthquake size. So magnitude scales with the size of the fault that ruptures. So if this is part of my fault that ruptures, here's the other part, and it slips. The fault rupture area is the size of my hand. You can also have very small earthquakes. Say the fault rupture area was the size of this quarter. Two quarters, that's the size of your fault rupture area. It slips and that's your earthquake, that's the same thing as a negative two earthquake. So the size of that earthquake fault that ruptures in a negative two earthquake is about the size of these quarters. I use this to try to get quarters from people, but I know you're all teachers, so I decided not to. Um, for a magnitude two earthquake, the size of the fault area, again, this is one part of the fault, the other part of the fault, this is what moves. The size of the fault area that moves in a magnitude two earthquake is about the size of a football field. So that earthquake that we saw earlier, 1.7 or so, was about the size of a football field. Somebody mentioned earlier that these scale logarithmically. So magnitude 8 is about 300 miles long. There's an 1857 earthquake, went from San Bernardino all the way up to Parkfield. Magnitude 8, 300 miles long. Same thing with the Denali 2002 earthquake. 300 miles long was that fault. So one increased unit in magnitude is 10 times more ground motion amplitude, and one increased unit in magnitude is 30 times more energy. So these are hard things to get across to your class, and just I think it's best to just spew out a lot of things and see what's going to hit. One thing you can do is you can talk about things like this. You say, you know, the numbers that we're talking about in terms of the amplitude are these numbers here on this side, but instead of saying these really long numbers, we're just going to say the number of zeros that they have. This one has one zero, magnitude one, magnitude two, two zeros, three zeros, etc. Try to get the point across that there is a thousand times more ground motion amplitude from a magnitude seven earthquake than a magnitude four earthquake. So San Diego will routinely have some magnitude four earthquakes that people feel, and then take that opportunity and say, wow, everybody felt that. It was, you know, some shaking. Can you imagine it a thousand times bigger? And that would be a magnitude seven. 
everyone's always disheartened when I put up this. This is a list of the top uh, nine earthquakes, the largest magnitude earthquakes. And here are continental US. We don't have a single one. Huh. The biggest one was in Chile, 1960. This fault rupture was really long. It stretched essentially from San Diego way past San Francisco, you can imagine. Gigantic. Alaska, 1954, is a 9.2. So the smallest magnitude here is an 8.6. A lot of times when you say, um, talk about the biggest ones, especially after we've had a big earthquake, people say, well, what about Haiti? Haiti should be on that. Think of all that devastation and destruction. Well, Haiti is about 345 on the list. We have about 15 magnitude 7 earthquakes per year, and Haiti was about a magnitude 7. So the problem with Haiti is they didn't have the appropriate building construction. Then you can also point out most of these earthquakes are along the Pacific plate, and that's because that plate is pretty fast moving. It's moving at about eight centimeters per year. Now, I think you've gotten your class up to going, well, P waves are really fast. They can go to Disneyland in under a sec, under a minute. And S waves are fast, and surface waves are fast. So when she says Pacific plate is moving fast, it must really be zipping too. But eight centimeters per year, that's um, maybe about as fast as your hair grows. So it, it's fast in terms of plate motion, but not fast in terms of something you really want to watch. So what we've been talking about mostly is magnitude, which is a quantitative measure of earth shaking. It's based on either the amplitude of the ground motion or the amount of energy released. The other thing we can measure is intensity, and that's based on damage and muon perception. And these are very different quantities. For intensity, they use the modified mortality scale. And to try to get this across, I usually say, okay, how many people have been in an earthquake? And often the whole class will raise their hand. So we might get up, up here for Northridge or Loma Prieta, something like that. So you can see kind of what these numbers represent. And then you can look at a map of what that shaking might be. So here's the intensities. The warm colors, the reds and yellows, are region of larger intensity, more shaking. And the cool colors, the blues and greens, are region of not much shaking. So right away you can see, well, there's a lot of shaking here, and indeed that's the near the epicenter of the Loma Prieta magnitude 6.9 earthquake. You can compare that to Crescent City in 2005, a magnitude 7, and there's hardly any reds at all. It's almost all blues and greens. And the reason is because hardly anyone lives up here where this region is highly populated. So as a seismologist, do I want intensity measurements or magnitude measurements? I'd much rather have magnitude measurements. But it is kind of fun to go in here and see how much people exaggerate. Um, if you do have, feel an earthquake, the next day in class you should reserve part of the time to go to this Did You Feel It page. It's run by the USGS and you put in uh, your name, your address, your zip code, et cetera, and then you know, what, did things fall off the wall, did, did your chimney fall down, what happened? So what's the motivation for doing that? Well, if you go in four or more times, always spell your name the same, always have the same zip code, they go, oh, Debbie, she's a frequent feeler. We'll take her information a little more important than others. And it's not because they think I'm going to tell the truth. It's just that they're going to get a relative measure. So, oh, wow, that one, and, and Debbie said she woke up? Whoa, that must have really been the shaker. So things like that. So I'd encourage you to, if you ever feel an earthquake, go in and try to earn your frequent feeler patch. Um, next, we're going to go a little bit over what are seismologists working on now. And it's changed, I think, within the last uh, five years, 10 years, what we're working on now. Because it used to be, well, let's come up with theories, and we'll see how that matches the data and iterate that way. But now we have so much more data. We're having continual data recorded all over the globe, 24 hours a day, and seeing things that we had never seen before. So it's a really exciting time for seismologists. And that way, we can really fine tune our models. So let's look at, this is the Los Angeles Basin. Newport Beach is down here. Uh, Malibu Point is up here. Here's the north arrow. Uh, the lines represent freeways, if anybody knows the area. We're going to watch surface displacement from an earthquake in a homogeneous crust. So it just kind of starts in one place, and then it nicely goes out just like ripples on a pond. So is this what really happens? Is this what the data would show us? And we found, no, that's not what the data would show us. This is more accurate representation. So once you account for the local surface geology and the basin structure of Los Angeles, those seismic waves are completely different. So we have to start saying, okay, well, here's something that's important to include in our models, but how much detail are we going to use? How much data do we have? 
and how fine-tuned can we do our, uh, get our models, and how will that progress our science forward? Another thing we ask is, well, well, where do we think the next large earthquake might occur? And let's study that and see how we can better prepare for it. This is a map of California. Historical ruptures are color-coded. The San Andreas Fault starts up here in the north, comes all the way down, and goes to the east of the Salton Sea. The 1857 rupture we were talking about is here in yellow. The 1906 earthquake rupture people have probably heard about is up here in green. So one thing that jumps out at you is the San Andreas Fault. Nothing's really ruptured here in the historic times. So we might think that the next large earthquake could be along that segment. So let's give a look at that. This is a Terra Shake animation. It was created here at the San Diego Supercomputer Center. And it's going to look at a 7.9 earthquake on the San Andreas Fault, rupturing from the southern San Andreas by the Salton Sea up to the north. Here's San Diego for reference, Palm Springs, and the LA Basin. So who, who wants to be in Los Angeles for this one? <laughs> who wants to be in San Diego for this one? Let's watch it again. Palm Springs would be a rocking good time, too. So again, that's, that's kind of because of the, the basin structure that we have here. So this is a computer model based on available data. I'll read it one more time just because it's fascinating. Another important thing is that the rupture is rupturing from the south to the north. So you can think of being in a swimming pool, and if I want to get you wet, I go, wah, and you guys will be all wet, and you guys will be laughing, going, ah, they're wet. So it matters which direction the seismic energy is coming. So if the earthquake started up here in the north and went to the south, the seismic energy would be going into Mexico. So a big difference depending on where the earthquake is going to start, where is it going to go. So just a reminder, this is one scenario, one example of what could happen. We don't know that this is the real McCoy. Next, I'm going to demo some movies made by Dr. Chuck Amon from Penn State. <coughs> I'll start this up here. Each circle is a seismic station from the US Array, or Scopes US Array. And we're looking at uh, an example seismogram here on the bottom. At each seismic station, when the energy there motion goes up, it's red. When it goes down, it's blue. And you can see nice banding coming across from this 8.4 earth earthquake from Sumatra. And we have the larger amplitude waves coming through. Again, you can kind of see a nice banding. Then things get a little haywire. You can see some hints of banding, but it looks like seismic energy might be bouncing off the Rocky Mountains, or we're not quite sure what's going to happen. And remember, the seismic energy, for the most part, was coming from the north here and going down to the south. But now it looks like it's going the other way. What's with that? So what's happening, so that was an earthquake in Sumatra. Where are we? <laughs> here. And it's traversing across the United States. And here's the short ray path. But the seismic, grams, the seismic rays are going this direction, but they're also coming around the back of the Earth. And that's what you see when you see the seismic waves come up from the bottom. So that's just the vertical component. We have more data than that. What if we wanted to look at the horizontal components, too? So we're going to do the same thing, but we're going to use a little ticker to tell you where exactly that horizontal motion is coming from from the north to the south, north to the south. So this is gaining a little bit more information. You can really see where that seismic energy is coming from, and you can see consistency between the stations. This is also used to see if there's a bad station in the mix. We've pretty much gotten rid of those, but they just obviously jump out at you like a sore of thumb. And here comes our kind of crazy part. Let's see if we're getting any more information. It's really just, you can see a little bit of pattern in there, but crazy. And then we'll wait for the seismic waves to come up from the other part of the Earth. We'll start to see them coming up from the south. And then our larger amplitude waves 
more, co more coherent. So this is just data. Let's see what the theory predicts and compare the two. On this side is the data, and on this side is our model. So you can see we're already off. It looks like the velocity structure is a little bit off. The broad strokes are pretty good, but there's some details that we could definitely work on. So maybe a decade ago, we would say, <coughs> here's the data, here's the model, overlay the two and go, hmm, yeah, they look pretty well, pretty good, our model's spot on. But now that we have so much more information, we can really fine tune our models. And there, the banding is matching pretty well. Okay, let's move on. Can anyone predict earthquakes? Everyone's always disappointed when I say, well, it's complicated. And they hate that answer, but let me try to explain why. And it's because from surface measurements of the Earth, we're attempting to understand the full Earth structure. So you guys have done this before, I'm sure. If you think of this candy, if you look in a candy box and you see a bump sticking out of it, you're pretty sure it's going to be a nut of some kind. If it's just smooth on top, you don't know if it's going to be gross oak coconut or nougat or some half and half combination. So here you're having trouble to figuring out what's inside a candy, and it's only this big and you can look around it. Same thing with a cupcake. If there's a kid's kind of toy up here, then you think, well, it's probably sickly sweet. Or the wedding cake, well, it's probably got something strawberry in it. So there's hints at the surface, but you really don't know what's going on inside. And this is for small-scale candy, cupcake, or wedding cake. Now think of scaling that all the way up to the Earth, and you're asking me to just take surface measurements and tell you exactly what the Earth's structure is. So that's difficult. The other problem is that a lot of the Earth is covered with water. And one way to get this across to your class is to do a ball toss. So you can take a, a ball like this and throw it to your one of the students and say, did your hands land on water or land? You go, oh, water, water. Next student, oh, water, land. Water, land. And as you go on long enough, you realize, wow, there's a lot of the Earth that has water. And it's actually about 75% of the Earth. So let's think back to our seismometer. Remember it had big cases, it had a lot of electronics, it needed power, it needed some way to store that data. How are we going to put all that stuff on the bottom of the ocean, and should we even bother trying? So do you guys think we should put seismometers on the bottom of the ocean? Yes, absolutely. The more data we have, the better. Good. I like that. And we can now do that. It's called Ocean Bottom Seismometer. Scripps owns about 110 of them, and they're about 500 pounds. This is what one might look like going in the water, and inside is all this electronics. So it has to have its own power supply, its own data recording, all that stuff that we saw at Pinion Flat that could spread out wherever it wanted has to be easily contained, taken on the ship, in working order. If you went, oh, I forgot a part, you know, <laughs> that could be trouble. Um, just like land seismometers, some ocean by bottom seismometers have trouble. Here's one that was actually buried by a lava eruption off the East Pacific rise. Um, here's a picture of the newest seismometers. These um, came online just recently. They gave up on the big, the big globe thing, and they now have these orange slabs. And each slab has millions of very small glass spheres embedded in them. So when they want them to float, they float. They're also a little more compact and easier to, to pack on the shipboard. Um, so back to the question, can anyone predict earthquakes? And I think that I can. Is everybody ready for my prediction? Chance of an earthquake today is 100%. And we already saw that on our map, right? Somewhere on the earth. Somewhere on the earth. So what you're really asking, can anyone predict a large earthquake near me, relatively short time frame, right? So let's just think of uh, continental US. The time between large magnitude earthquakes, magnitude 7 and above, is about 50 to 100 years. So if I tell you I'm pretty sure there's going to be magnitude 7 earthquake somewhere in California within the next 100 years, spot on. I just predicted something I'm pretty sure is going to happen. But that's too large of an uncertainty for you, right? Even 50 years, you're probably going, no, I want it you know, within my lifetime. We need to shorten that. And so this is a frustration for some people. So let's take. You know, that was the whole world and looking at seven and above. Let's, let's scale it back and say, well, what if we tried to predict magnitude six or something smaller? Could we do that? So this is back to our earthquake rupture map. And you might have caught your eye here. In the Parkfield region, earthquakes pop off about every 22 years or so. 
And so let's see if we can just go to the park filled region and predict when those magnitude six earthquakes occur. Do you guys think you can predict those? I have full confidence in you. Okay, so this is a little movie. This is gonna do a bang whenever there's a park field magnitude six earthquake, and it's your job to predict when the next one will be. I'll give you a couple for warm up. That's the first one. Okay, now, shout out now when you think it's gonna be. Somebody got it, I don't know who it was. I think at least three or four got that one. Uh, zero on that one. <laughs> Pretty sure that was a zero, unless somebody somebody was soft. <laughs> somebody over there got that one. Okay, anybody get uh, at least one? At least two? Three? Four? None. Did anyone get all of them? No. Okay, I'm going to show you how you can get all of them in one easy lesson, and you don't even have to pay $9.99. You ready? I'll, I'll demonstrate how to do it. Now, 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 perfect. Now, 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 Perfect. So the question is, how many did I get wrong compared to how many I got right? So a lot of people out there that say they can predict earthquakes, they'll say, see, here's my prediction in this important journal, and here's the earthquake. Here's my prediction in this television thing, and here's the earthquake. Well, that's all good and true, but the ones that they're not telling you about is how often they get it wrong. So I think this is a good way to introduce why, why do seismologists suck at predicting earthquakes? when we actually don't. It's a very difficult problem and uh, something that we're working on. Uh, we can take a few questions and then I'm just going to demo some more 3D interactive visualizations. So the question is, do animals give you any indication that an earthquake is coming? And a lot of people think yes. I personally think no. They did a lot of studies where if you think, oh, I'm sure you've all heard this, little Fluffy was acting so bizarre right before the earthquake. She, I'm sure she knew it was coming. But then if you say, well, how often does little Fluffy act bizarre? And, oh, you know, five, six times a day. Whoa. Well, <laughs> so um, to my knowledge, I think the answer is no. Animals can't predict earthquakes, but there are some people that believe they can. That's a good question. So the question was, well, what about dogs hearing? They can hear so much better than us. That's a good point. So one thing that's on my list of things to do is to be really close to an earthquake so I can hear the P wave, the, the seismic waves reverberating so fast through the rock. When the earthquake ruptures and the P wave goes out, if you're close enough, you'll hear this really high-pitched sound and a dog might be able to hear that before we can. But are they predicting the earthquake before it happens? No, they're hearing the information. Do you have a fine line? That's a really good point that somebody brought up. Thanks. Oh, so the question was, have people actually predicted these and had a better success rate than failure rate? And the answer was that some people claim they have, but I'm really skeptical about that. Okay, so the question was, so here's our 1857 um, earthquake, large earthquake rupture. Right. And the question is, do we expect another large earthquake there? One, because it's been so long, and two, because we know that part of the fault can withstand large earthquakes. Well, we'll put you down there as a uh, predicting that one. Your guess is, I mean, we're all making educated guesses here. So that's an excellent educated guess, and that's an excellent way to say, this is what I think, and this is why I think it. A lot of people say, that the San Andreas Fault is the next one to go because it hasn't been in historic seismicity in quite a while. Um, I personally think I'd be more worried about the San Jacinto Fault. It's closer to us and very complicated structure. Um, do you want to he hear a little side note about the San Andreas in this region? So one thing we're studying here at Scripps is the, how the effect of the lake load from the Salton Sea might affect the San Andreas Fault. And there used to be a large lake in that region. You thought, well, maybe all that water pressure is going to change the stresses in the region and that will drive uh, earthquake on the San Andreas Fault. So we can look at some, um, fr some historical seismicity data and um, try to figure out, well, is that true? And we looked and looked and it says, well, no, that's not quite true. But now there have been new faults that have been found underneath the San Andreas, underneath the Salton Sea by researchers at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And what we think is happening is that there was a lake load 
It loaded the faults under the lake, and it's probable that those faults ruptured and the stress changes from that loaded the San Andreas. Now, we haven't had that high a lake level again since then, and so that is taken out of the equation. So that might be one possibility why we haven't seen a large earthquake here in the San Andreas. But again, you know, we're, the data we're working with is a little sketchy. Right, another question over here? Yeah, so the question is, and I'm probably not the right one to answer, but the question is, so the Salton Sea used to be a lot bigger, and now it's a lot less. What's happened to all that water? Is it essentially getting sucked down into the bottom like a sponge? And I'm not a hydrologist, so I don't really know the answer to that question, I'm afraid. But, I mean, these are good things you want your students to start saying, well, what about this? What about this? Uh-huh. So the question is, we had a, we've been having a lot of swarms down by the Salton Sea, but a lot of those earthquakes are magnitude like two and three, some are magnitude four, very rarely magnitude five. Remember that, that stress or strain release is really small on the, small, on the scale of things because we, we scale by a factor of 10 for the ground amplitude and a factor of 30 for the energy released. The question was, well, how come Washington and Oregon, they're up 10 and 5? Why aren't they higher in the list of um, U.S. rankings? And the answer is because the San Andreas Fault comes up here through California, and then it goes offshore, so we have a triple junction offshore. There's not a major fault running through these, these two states. The question was, what about Mount St. Helens? That must influence things. But here we're not counting volcanoes, we're counting earthquakes. But it raises the questions, can volcanoes trigger earthquakes or can earthquakes trigger volcanoes? And I've done a little bit of work on that and it looks like large earthquakes can trigger mud, mud volcano eruptions if the intensity is high enough and the, the, two, the pair is close enough. Um, so let me tell you a little bit what we're going to do. I'm going to demo some of the 3D uh, visualizations. You saw one of the worlds. Let's go and look at Parkfield. Parkfields are really nice and easy location. So just to acclimate, here's the California-Mexico border, the Salton Sea. And we're going to zoom up here to Parkfield. I'm not a geologist, but even I can see the trace of the San Andreas coming through here. The lines that look like bugs here, those are just our seismic telemetry lines. We're going to go underground and take a look at the 2004 aftershock sequence. So the main shock is here, the red diamonds, and the aftershocks are the other colored symbols. And you can see the main shock is to the south compared to the aftershocks, which is a sheer indication that the earthquake ruptured from the south to the north. So without seeing any seismic waveforms, just seeing the uh, aftershock distribution, immediately I knew, ooh, this earthquake went from the south to the north, which is kind of cool. Um, then these different color symbols are color coded by magnitude. If you can't remember what's what, you can turn on the data sets here. Um, over three, let's toggle those on and off, are the, the pink diamonds. Two to three are the yellow diamonds. One to two, the blue orbs, etc. So now let's turn and look at this edge on. Beautiful. It aligns very nicely with the San Andreas Fault. Almost all the earthquakes are right on the San Andreas Fault. So as a seismologist, I say, here's where the earthquakes are and here's where I think the fault is. And the geologist says, based on the surface, here's where I think the fault is. And we go, oh, we agree. But <laughs> it's not always the, the case that that happens. So this is our really simple case of Parkfield. Also of note is the earthquakes go down to about 10 kilometers depth, maybe 15 kilometers. Let's compare this now with Southern California. Get acclimated. So we have some topography and bathymetry. If you're a diver, people love to just go look at that. Here's the Scripps Canyon, actually, that comes offshore here. This makes for great diving. Um, San Diego, La Jolla, Del Mar, Oceanside. Earthquakes recorded by the ANZA Seismic Network from Scripps are shown with the yellow cubes. Salton Sea is here for reference. Now let's do what we did before, where we're just going to go under and take a look at the seismicity. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it looks kind of blob-like from that direction, huh? Well, it's, it all looks like a blob to me. But you know what? Maybe we don't have enough vertical exaggeration. So you can use this little triangle thing to add some vertical exaggeration. Whee! Maybe we'll be able to better see it. So we'll spin around. Blob, 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 blob. Nothing at all like Parkfield, right? So it's more rupturing. It's kind of rupturing a volume or a system of faults. There's, there's some, so I think what you saw, let's go under and see. Somebody had the eagle eye, and they saw the Landers rupture up here. So here's Landers and some of the Landers aftershocks, and Hector Mine was right next door. And you can see even looking at it from map view that that has some kind of structure. But most of the San Jacinto fault is just a, a mess. <laughs> right. Um, for this freeware, a few tips. One I already told you is you could change the vertical exaggeration. If you get lost in hyperspace, you go, ah! You can go to camera and do reset camera, ha, back above ground, and we're off. You do need a three-button mouse in order to operate this software. Um, Want to bear with me and see one more? This Earth plates is a fun one. This was put together by Dr. David Sanwell at Scripps. And it's a nice way to show global view of plate tectonics. So there's a San Andreas fault coming up here. You can see the uh, Mendocino Trinfold Junction. Hawaii is where it should be, over here, not to the south. It's kind of fun to see the Hawaiian island chain, largest where the volcanoes are active and then smaller as where the volcano path was. Uh, we can go over and see where the Sumatra earthquake was. That's one thing we didn't talk about was tsunamis. There's some tsunami information on our website. Three things you need to have in order to generate a tsunami. You need the earthquake to be relatively shallow in order to displace the water. And um, you need it to be um, a certain kind of rupture so strike-slip rupture, if you're just rupturing like this, you're not really displacing the water. You need a reverse rupture like that. Uh-huh. <laughs>